All right, you guys, uh, for the next few weeks, for this week and for Friday, uh, which we call Good Friday, which um, only ended up being good in the aftermath, right? Uh, in the first Good Friday, it wasn't feeling very good. Um, but, and then for Easter, we're gonna, the theme of our time here, we're going to call it this. Uh, that's a nice little story. Um, so it just feels like sometimes when we approach this thing called Palm Sunday and Easter that we turn it into just kind of a nice little story. It feels a little bit like this, you know, just kind of palms. It's really pretty. Uh, it's green. It's warm. It's about victory. Uh, it's, about, it's about peace. And, and it just feels good. And then we get to this issue uh, of Easter, and, and it feels like it's about bunnies. Uh, and then it's about chicks. You know, and, and then uh, eventually you get to the place where it feels like it's a lot like these flowers. And, uh, and, and then we can add the colored eggs. Uh, that feels great. Uh, and then maybe most of all, best of all, peeps. It's all about the peeps, you know. And, uh, <laughs> and so uh, <laughs> you've got to have peeps. Yeah, right on, peeps, right? And so uh, 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 and there it is. It's so cute. It's so nice. It's just so fun, right? You know, and it's about frilly socks, and, uh, and it's a little, sometimes it starts to feel a little bit like Disneyland. You know, if you're, you guys ever go to Disneyland or Disney World, you walk into to the Enchanted Kingdom, you know, and, and there they are, there's this beautiful book, and it's all about Cinderella, they got this book, and it's, it's just cool, you know, Cinderella and Snow White, and it's just really pretty, it's really nice, and, uh, and but you guys, we got to admit, We've manufactured this story, right? We've manufactured it. So let's see if we can make it a little more real. Uh, at least we should make it about a lamb, right? This story is about a lamb. Um, but frankly, even this isn't really what it's really all about. That's a little too pretty. It's really, it looks more like this. The story is all about it's a little more brutal. So in a sense, if we take the story and really let's peel back the surface of this story. Let's peel back in a way the Disneyland feel-good, frilly, pastel color part of the story. Let's peel that back and let's find out what the real story is all about. Because it's more about this story right here. And eventually, there, it's going to be a story of peace. And that's what we're going to talk about today and on Friday and next Sunday. It's, about, it's a story about peace, but it's not a cute story. It's not a fun story. It's a difficult story uh, that we're going to walk into in these, these couple of days. So uh, I want to just jump right into the story then and say, okay, what really happened on that day? What, what is really going on there? Uh, and so we're going to, all four of the Gospels record with this thing that we call the triumphal entry or the Palm Sunday experience. All four of them record it in different amounts of detail, but I've selected uh, out of the Gospel of Matthew. We're going to look at that and see what it has to say to us uh, today. So in verse 1, it says this, And now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage the, uh, on the Mount of Olives, and Jesus sent two of his disciples. We'll stop there just for a second. Um, when they've come close now to Jerusalem, they're headed there. So Jesus has just come from his ministry in Galilee, and he's come down the Jordan River, and they came to uh, Jericho, and there's where he met Zacchaeus, and Zacchaeus, who is a short little guy that wanted to see Jesus, who was kind of a, a major leader in the city of Jericho, uh, comes to faith in Christ. And then they head up that 17-mile uh, distance between Jericho and Jerusalem, which is almost all uphill. In fact, it's one of the most dangerous roads in the world. Uh, it always has been and still is. Even during World War II, there were still guys who just hung out on that road and robbed people as they came by. It's an incredibly dangerous road. And Jesus and his disciples come up that road, and they come eventually to Bethany and to Bethphage, and they're, they're hanging out there. That's where Lazarus is raised from the dead. And it's an incredible miracle, and things are starting to build. There's an excitement about things that are going on. And then on this particular day, Jesus is going to come from those places, and he's going to come through the city of Bethphage, and he's going to head for Jerusalem. And his disciples are with him, and things are building, and it's exciting. And here's kind of what goes on. It says, now that when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, the Mount of Olives, and Jesus sent two of his disciples, and he said, go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them. Now, it's interesting here. Only Matthew is the one who records that there's both a donkey and its colt. All the rest of the Gospels, 
just say there's a donkey. But here it records the details that there were really two animals that they, that they took. And he says, untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, the Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. It's kind of like we don't really know exactly if Jesus set this up, you know, if he said arranged for it, or if he had a friend that lived in this village who was aware of the situation. We don't really know. All he says is, if someone says, hey, what are you doing? You know, it's kind of like someone comes onto your property and, you know, kind of starts to borrow your car. Uh, and the person says, hey, you know, you can say, hey, what are you doing? They go, hey, the Lord needs them. You go, oh, go ahead, take it. It's all yours. You know, and it's just something that this, whoever this was somehow understood that the Lord has the authority and has need of this. Yeah, he's like, go ahead and take it. So then in verse 4, this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the son of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. Now, let's look at it real quick. This comes out of the book of Zechariah, the prophet Zechariah. The prophet Zechariah is a prophet in what we call the post-exilic time. So it's after Israel had been judged and they had been overwhelmed and they had been taken into exile in Babylon and they come back to Jerusalem and there are several different prophets who are speaking during that time. Malachi is one of them, Haggai is another, and Zechariah. And they begin to, to prophesy of what God is going to do with his people, the Jews, what he's going to do with them and what his plan is for them. And Zechariah begins to prophesy of the future. And here he says in verse 9 of uh, chapter 9, he says, Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, the daughters, daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he. Humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So here he is. I mean, uh, Zechariah is painting a picture of the future. Now, they've just come out of exile. Things are not going that well in Jerusalem at this point. They're trying to rebuild the city. They're trying to rebuild the temple, but it's difficult. But he's, Zechariah is saying to them, hey, you guys, God has a plan. God has been unfolding this plan all along. He hasn't forgotten about you. He's doing things. Yes, he took you into exile. Yes, he, he, he disciplined you. But God never disciplines for the purpose of punishment. God always disciplines for the purpose of reconciliation. That's what he's doing. And so he says, God has a plan. And he prophesies here that their king is going to come mounted on a donkey. Wow, it's incredible. Look in verse 10. And he says, and I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem and the battle bow shall be cut off and he shall speak peace to the nations. And he will, his rule shall be from sea to sea and from from the river to the ends of the earth. He begins to describe that there is going to be a king who comes, and he will come and he will have peace in his hand. But he also describes one who will, will, will take, take over from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. Sometimes in the Old Testament, it will begin to talk about the coming of the Messiah. It almost has a double-edged sword to it. There's, sometimes he talks about this one who will come in peace, and there are other times where he talks about it, one who will come with power. And, and sometimes it's hard to see in the Old Testament one from the other. But as we go and get into the New Testament, we see that clearly they, that there are maybe two comings of, of, of this Messiah. Uh, and we'll talk about that here in a minute. But he comes and he talks about this one who will come in peace. So when you come on a donkey, when a, when a, when a conquering general would come into a city, he would come one of two ways, having conquered that city. He would come, one, if he came on a donkey, it meant that he was coming in peace. And, and the, the, that's his expression. There's another way that he would come into a city, and we'll talk about that here in just a moment. But let's go back to verse 6 uh, I, in, in Matthew. And it says, The disciples went and did as, did as Jesus had directed them. And they brought the donkey and the colt and put, them, and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. And most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the, on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Look, go to verse 9. And the crowds that went before him and that, were fo and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Now, Hosanna means he saves. 
And what they were saying is, we, something's going on here that we believe that this man named Jesus, this one who had been ministering around us and among us for three years, was coming and there was something unique going on. And so they began to say, save, God, save us, the son of David. Because they understood that the Messiah would come through the line of David. And they knew something unique was happening here. And so they were all excited about it. It says the people before him and the people after him. So you can tell this is an exciting day coming into Jerusalem as he rides down off uh, the Mount of Olives. And if you even could picture it right here, if this is north, over here we have Jerusalem. And in the middle here we have the, the, the Valley of Kidron. And, and over here is the Mount of Olives. And there's this road that comes down the Mount of Olives from Bethany and from Bethphage. And he is riding down this on this colt. And the people are beginning to see it's Jesus. He's coming. And they're excited before and behind him. And as he comes down the mountain on this, on this donkey, people are beginning to sing and praise God and say, Hosanna to the son of David. Messiah is coming. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Wow, they're all fired up. Hosanna. He who is on the highest is the one who saves. They are fired up about this thing. Now, yeah, let's go over to the book of Luke just for a second. It gives us a little bit of an expanded look at what's going on. Um, in Luke 19, verses 36 through 40, it says this. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the ground or on the road. And, he w and as he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen. Now, when it says here, the whole multitude of his disciples, what he's referring to is that there were those 12 that he had called to be with him in a very unique way. There were three that he spent an incredible amount of time with, Peter, James, and John. He had invested in them deeply. The other 12 were his disciples. They'd spent three years traveling with him, hanging out with him, doing dinner together, doing work projects together, watching miracles. They had seen things that they had never dreamed of. And there's somehow this man had begun to influence their lives and touch them in a way that they couldn't even explain. <clears throat> At one point, he even asked Peter, Peter, all these people say I'm all sorts of things. Who do you say that I am? And he says, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And he says, will you leave me too? And he says, where else do I have to go? Where else would I go having met you? and walk with you. Where would I go? There's no place to go but with you. And, and it's not, it, this whole disciples, not only the 12, but it, when it says the multitude of disciples, Jesus had hundreds of people who followed him in a very consistent way. Uh, there was a group of about 150 who, who kind of followed him all over the place. There was a group of 500 who were kind of come and go kind of disciples. They were trying to figure out who he was, and they spent a lot of time with him. And as he comes to Jerusalem here for Passover, this whole multitude of disciples, people who could, would have called themselves followers of Jesus, this rabbi, this, this what they were going to call a prophet, they were following him and they're excited. They're saying something's going on here. We want to be a part of it. And with a loud voice for all the mighty work that they had seen, they were praising God. And here's what they were saying. Let's go to verse 38. Because they say, they're saying this. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Now, I don't know about you, but that reminds me a little bit of what happened at his birth. Remember when the angels came and they sang? They were singing glory to God in the highest and, pray and, and peace among men with whom he is well pleased. Th this whole theme of, of praise and peace has been part of Jesus' life from the very beginning. It's what he was all about, is creating a peace where peace never existed. Now, I love this in verse 39. It says this, And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Hey, teacher, tell your disciples to knock it off. You know, they rebuke, rebuke your disciples. Tell them to shut up. And, and can you imagine? Uh, here, here are the Pharisees, the religious leaders of their day in the city of Jerusalem. And Jesus is coming into town, and everything is exciting. I mean, there is like a... And, uh, you know, a, a happening, happening here. And they're not very fired up about this. And so the, so the Pharisees come to him and they say, hey, Jesus, can you tell your guys to shut up, knock it off, calm down? 
this is a scary deal. You know, here we are at Passover and people are getting excited. And there's, a, there's thousands, in fact, tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands coming here to Jerusalem and we don't want any trouble. We don't want there to be any problems. So this is not a good start to the week, Jesus. Could you tell them to pipe down? And Jesus, I love his answer. He goes, well, I don't know. I'll tell you this, that if they're quiet, if they do be quiet, I'm not going to tell them to be quiet. But even if I were to tell them to be quiet, he goes, here's the deal. The very stones would cry out. The very stones that sit on the ground would begin to praise the coming of Messiah. Now, I don't know. I don't think the Pharisees probably liked that very much. I think they probably were like, oh, shut up, Jesus. You know, I mean, like, but they didn't know what to do with that. And he says that the whole, all of nature will praise the reality of God coming into our midst. And he comes with this powerful, powerful presentation of peace. Wow, that's pretty incredible, isn't it? So he comes, and, and, and what, they think, what I think they thought was coming was maybe he was going to take over. They didn't like being under the hand of the Romans. It wasn't a very enjoyable experience. And here's a guy who's coming, and he's preaching peace. And I think people are excited, and they're like, man, can't wait till this takes place. Can't wait till it takes over. Can't wait for this to happen. Somehow we're going to push aside this dictatorial Romans and the theocracy again, maybe under this prophet Jesus, will take over. We're excited about it, but they didn't understand. Really, in order to make peace, it was going to have to be about this. This is how he was going to make peace. And during that week, it began to fall apart. They're so excited on Sunday. But then on, on Monday, he goes to the temple and he turns over all the tables. And I'm sure if, if I were one of the disciples, I, I would have wanted to take him aside and say, hey, Lord, this really started out well. You know, we had a good thing going. People were excited. And this is kind of a negative. You know, what'd you do that for? And then as the week began to unfold, it got worse and worse and worse. And instead of being that really nice little white lamb, it turns into this. Wow. Because Jesus knew. Jesus knew what he was doing. He told them for months what was going on. In fact, look at Matthew 16. This is back, obviously, five chapters before. This is months before this. A couple of times, Jesus tells them what's going to happen. Look in, in 16, he says this. For the time that, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. Once again, Peter took him aside and he said, and he began to rebuke him. That's a gutsy thing. It's like they rebu rebuke Jesus. <laughs> like, okay, I don't know. But he rebukes him and he says, far be it from you, Lord, shall it never happen to you. Well, look at this in ver verse 23. But he turned and said to Peter, now, just think of this strong statement. Okay, so Peter says, Jesus, never. This, is, this can't happen. This is inappropriate. Stop it, Jesus. Stop talking like this. But you're going to have to go to Jerusalem and be killed. He just stop this. And, and Jesus says to him, he doesn't just say, hey, Peter, I know what I'm doing. I know what's happening here. Look at, the, look at this. Get behind me, Satan. Wow. Talk about a rebuke. Talk about, I'm sure it had to stun him. Like, not just, hey, knock it off, Peter, one of my best friends. He says, get thee behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me. For you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. You see, what Peter wanted and what most of the people wanted, what you and I, I think, would have wanted is for Jesus to kind of come into Jerusalem and, and they'd be this person of peace and that everyone would receive him and that they would say, hey, Romans, we don't need you anymore. Thank you for coming. Uh, but we have some boats that are ready to take you home and we're going to take over and Jesus the prophet is in place and we really like him. Uh, and that's what we want to be all about. Uh, 
And Jesus knew, though, that he couldn't come to that. You see, that actually would never create peace. It would never have solved what really needed to be solved. And Jesus understood that he needed to come and to suffer for the cause of eternity. And so he says to Peter, get behind me, because your mind is on the things of man, not on the things of God. Wow. You guys, in, in, verse, in chapter 17, Jesus tells them again. Look at this in verse 17, uh, verses 22 and 23. And they were gathering in Galilee. This is before they'd come down to Jerusalem on this trip. And Jesus said to them, the Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men. And they will kill him, and he will be raised on the third day. And their response was that they were greatly distressed. You can imagine. Can you imagine being with this guy for three years, having him be an incredible friend? You loved him. You knew something was unique. And he was telling you that he was headed for his death. It had to distress them. They didn't know really how to add it up. I think what happened when they finally got to the Mount of Olives and headed into Jerusalem and things were going so well, they probably forgot this statement. They probably just kind of said, I don't know what that was all about, but this looks great. We're ha- this is a good day. And we're headed into Jerusalem and everybody's fired up and the Pharisees are telling everybody to be quiet and everybody's telling the Pharisees to go sit down. And we're going to have a, you know, this is a great day. Well, but Jesus kept knowing where he was headed and why he was headed there. Well, let's go back to Matthew chapter 21. In verse 10, it says, And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up, saying, Who is this? You see, most of Jesus' ministry had taken place in Galilee. Some of it had taken place outside of there, but really Jesus had not made Jerusalem his headquarters. He really had made Capernaum his headquarters and up north of the, uh, the Sea of Galilee. And he'd not been to Jerusalem that much. They'd heard about him. But they didn't know a ton about him. And they're saying, who is this? And the crowds are saying, this is the prophet from Nazareth and Galilee. And they go, oh, we've heard about him. And now there's all this excitement that's going on. And they were thinking that maybe there was going to be a transition in power. And they were excited about that. Well, Palm Sunday here is really about the king who came to give peace. This is his first coming is the time when he came to give peace. He offers peace. He gives himself as peace. Now, next time, and there in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 10, it talks about him taking over from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. That's the next time he comes. As we see in the New Testament, there's two comings of Christ because the second coming is a king who comes to exercise justice. When he comes back, you guys, let me just read this in, in Revelation chapter 19. In, in Revelation, this is a vision of the future that the Apostle John receives, and he begins to see what's going to happen, and he writes it down. And in chapters um, uh, 8 through 18, he's talking about this time called the tribulation, the time when at the end of the history when there will be incredible tribulation on the earth, and there will be Uh, a leader who will arise and look as if he's a man of peace, but he's actually a man of destruction, and there will be a time of tribulation, seven years of tribulation. And somewhere in the midst of that is the rapture of the church, but after that, Jesus is going to invite those who know him to to a supper of the Lamb that he's going to uh, host, and he will be there, and those who belong to him will be there too. But he will return then, the second coming. Look what it says. And you almost can't say this just by reading it. So I'll try not to be too dramatic. But if you don't read this with a little bit of drama, you miss the point, right? So next time he comes, it says, then I saw, this is, the, this is John uh, writing. He says, then I saw heaven open, opened and behold a white horse. And the one sitting on it is called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. There's this feeling of strength, of majesty, that when he comes back, and his eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head there are many diadems, or or crowns, if you will. And he has a name written that no one knows but himself. And I can't tell you what it is, because I don't know. He is clothed in the robe, dipped in blood, 
and the name by which he is called the Word of God. Reminds you of John chapter 1, doesn't it? Because in the beginning was the Word, and the Word is with God, and the Word was God. And in the Word of God is, in, is the person of Christ, that all the fullness of who God is is found in him. Wow. Look in verse 14. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. Wow, these armies of, of these, all these people on white horses behind him. It's a majestic feel, isn't it? And it's true, it's what's going to happen. It says, from his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. And he will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. Wow. You guys, here, here's the picture, is that God is not a wimp. God is not a patsy. He doesn't sit around wondering and worrying about the brokenness of this world. In his first coming, he comes to offer peace. And in his second coming, he will come and offer judgment. He will not be made weak. And he will come. And look at this last part. I love this last part. Verse 16. And on his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And I come to take over and to judge the world for the sin and the ugliness and the brokenness and, the, and what you've done to each other. And what has happened in this world, I'm coming to make it right. And he's coming. The beautiful thing, uh, the beautiful thing is this, that he came on Palm Sunday to be the one who came to give peace. And he offers that for us. And he offers it to every one of us. You guys, let me just read you a couple passages just about the peace that he brings. Look at Romans 5, verses 1, one, through one and 2. He says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we've not been justified by our works, by earning our way to God. There's nothing I can do that's good enough to make myself acceptable to God. It's by faith and the fact that he sent his son. Look at this. It says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God. You guys, just think about that. Having been justified by faith, we have peace. It's been made right. Being justified by our faith and faith placed in the work of Christ and what he did for me, that I surrender myself to that. And he says, here, we have peace with God. You ever wonder where you stand with God? Here's where you stand. When you stand in Christ, you stand in peace. It's what he offers, what he gives. It's what he's given us. Wow, it's an amazing thought. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. You know where you stand with God as you stand in this place that's called his grace. And this grace causes peace. Not because I earned it, not because I deserve it, not because I asked for it, because he gave it. As we put our faith in Christ. Wow, is that we have peace with him. Look at Romans 8, verses 5 and 6. It says, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. See, what he allows us to do is to, put, to have our minds captured by the reality of the grace of God. As he lives in us, and he begins to, to fill us, that as a mind in the spirit is one of peace. But that's where we can live. Look at this in Romans 12. It says, if possible then, if you've experienced and you live and stand in the grace and the peace of God, if that's where you live, then look at this. If possible, as far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. That peace that we have with him is supposed to translate into our relationship with each other as best we can do is it depends on us is to live peaceably with all. And that means with everyone in this room, everyone in this city, everyone in this state, everyone in this nation, everyone on this planet Earth, is as best as we can do is depends on us that we would live at peace. Wow. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine. And I will repay as I see fit. But leave it up to me. Your vengeance is not yours. Wow. That's incredible. Look at this. It goes on in verse 20. 
For the, on the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. You guys, I think we're in, in, entering into days in our nation, in this world, where it will be very tempting to take vengeance, on our, vengeance and try to do it ourselves, rather than that if our enemy is hungry, that we would feed him. If our enemy is thirsty, that we would give him something to drink. That we will not try to overcome uh, evil with evil, but we will overcome evil with good. I think he's calling us to that. Look in 2 Corinthians chapter 13. It says, finally, brothers, rejoice. Aim for restoration. Comfort one another. Agree with one another. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Wow, it's incredible what he's calling us to. Look in Ephesians chapter 2. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Here he's talking about the whole deal of of Gentiles being far from God. And he says, they've been brought near, for he himself is our peace. He himself is our peace, who who has made us both one and has broken down in the flesh the dividing wall of hostility. By abolishing, this is verse 15, by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he... Uh, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility between Jew and Gentile. See, he brings peace. Wow. So Palm Sunday, the king came to give peace. It's so clear, it's so simple, and yet so hard to understand sometimes. In 1962, uh, there was a guy named Don Richardson. He was 27 years old. He took his wife, Carol, and their son, Steve, and they moved to Indonesia, to Irian Jaya, among a people called the Sawe people. They were a primitive people. This is a picture of the Sawe tribe. They were a very primitive people, not stupid, not, not ignorant, but a very primitive people, still lived in a cannibalistic world. Uh, and they went there to learn to share the gospel. Uh, one of the things they have to do first is they have to learn the language, and so it took him uh, 10 hours a day for an entire year to begin to learn their language. Uh, in their verb tenses, they have 19 verb tenses in their language. Uh, just so you know, that's a lot, and that's a little confusing. You know, you're like, oh my gosh, and it took him a long time to learn their language. And he began to communicate the gospel, a- and it became a little bit unnerving for him and his wife as they began to share the gospel. And every time they would share the story, uh, of Easter, the, that the people, the Sawe people, they would cheer when it got to Judas. Because in their culture, treachery was the highest value. So the hero of the story of Easter was Judas. Because Judas tricked him. Judas said, man, I, I, I've become your friend, but I'm going to give you up for 30 pieces of silver. Watch this, man. I'm going to get you. And they cheered Judas, and they thought, that Jesus was duped. He was the dummy in the whole thing. You see, in their culture, it wouldn't have been uncommon for them to befriend someone from a neighboring tribe and to pull them in as a friend. And then, one evening, they would attack them and kill them and eat them. That was a victory. They thought it was so cool, we tricked him. Well, eventually, these three tribes in the area began to fight over being with the Richardsons because it was kind of cool to have these white uh, Canadian missionaries among them. And so they began to fight about it. And literally in front of the Richardsons' home, they were having battles. People were throwing spears and their arrows. People were getting killed. And eventually, the Richardsons said, being here, we are causing more trouble than doing good. And so they said to these tribes, if this doesn't stop, we need to leave because you're fighting over us. And this is crazy, and we don't want to cause that, so we're going to leave. And these tribes got together, and they began to say, no, we don't want you to leave, and we need to create peace. And so suddenly, one tribe, a man from one tribe, ran out of his group towards the other tribe, and they thought he was coming to try to kill them. But he was carrying a little baby. 
And as he ran to the other tribe, he handed over his son. And he gave it to them. And then he went back. And the deal is that this child, as long as he lived and was given and sacrificed, but the sacrifice was to give him away to this other tribe. As long as that child lived, there was peace among the tribes. And suddenly Don Richardson understood that this was a redemptive analogy he could use. And he said to them, this is what God has done. He's brought his son and he's given him to you to make peace. The gospel made total sense to him. Hundreds of them came to Christ. Today, 53 years later, there are thousands in those tribes, especially the Sawe, who are still followers of Jesus because they understood that God brought his son to make peace. And that's what he did for us, too. He gave us peace. So let me just ask you a few questions. Where do you find peace? Where do we look for peace in our lives? Really, practically, let's, let's think about it. Where do we look for peace? I, I think often where we look for peace is in our circumstances, right? We want our circumstances to be more peaceful, easier, smoother, not as painful. We look for peace in our circumstances. I don't know if you've ever noticed, but circumstances are not always under your control, you know? And, and circumstances are a little bit like the piles of life. I always say that there's a variety of piles in life, and you're either under the pile You've just gotten out of a pile, and if you did, you're headed for the next one, just so you know. You know, that's life, right? Life is conflict-oriented. The circumstances, whether it's because of your own doing or the doing of others, its circumstances are never going to be perfect. When, when we start demanding that they be perfect, we are demanding to go back to Eden. And Jesus said you can't go back there. The only place you're going to find peace is down there at the cross. That's the only place you'll find peace. Circumstances. And, and, and you guys just think of your circumstances right now. I'll guarantee you we all have a story. And we all have a painful story of your circumstances right now. But there's no peace there. Where, where do you find peace? Sometimes we look for peace in other people, right? We want other people to create the peace. You know, if the other person will just do this, I'd be better. You know, if you'd just grow up if you'd just stop being such a knucklehead, if you'd get it together, yeah? Yeah, I feel that way too, so totally. Yeah, are you talking about me? <laughs> yeah, if, you know, other people, that's where we want peace. The other person is causing my problem. It is your fault, right? We look for peace in other people. But I don't know about you, but other people sometimes disappoint. I don't know if you've ever noticed that. I've ever experienced that. But sometimes other people can be difficult. They can not do what's right. You know, and frankly, they're thinking that about me, right? And, and they're wrong, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, no, they're, they're pretty right. And uh, sometimes you look for peace in other people, and it's always disappointing. W what about this? Sometimes we find peace in self-medication. It's amazing what we do as adults. But sometimes we act so silly. We begin to seek for self-medication, whether it be an alcohol or some sort of addictive behavior or some sort of drug or some way that we medicate ourselves. We live in a world that's becoming almost outrageously common. And yet there's no peace there, is there? It's very short-term. And in fact, it's very destructive to our lives. Or sometimes... We find peace in wanting to take control. Say, okay, if you guys won't create peace, if I can't, if you, my circumstances are bad, the other people are bad, self-medication's bad, I'm taking charge. I'm going to control this, and I'll find peace in that. And yet it doesn't come. And so it seems to me that where it really comes is here in Galatians chapter 5, when it says, but the fruit of the Spirit of God that which God in his indwelling our lives, what he wants to produce in us, understanding that Christ gave himself for me freely to offer peace. And he said, not only do I want to make a peace pact with you, but I want to indwell you. I want to live inside of you. 
I want to change you. I want to mold you from the inside out rather than the outside in. And I want to give you some things. I want to give you fruit. I want to give you this qualities. Look at this, the qualities. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And against such things, there's no law that makes it easy. And there never will be that says that you can't be loving, joyful, peaceful, patient, kind, good, faithful, gentle, have self-control. He wants to give us peace. That's why he came. That's why he came on that, that Palm Sunday. He didn't come to take over. He came to offer peace. And the only place he could do it was in the darkness of Friday when he gave his life on a cross to pay the penalty for our sins, to give us peace. Sunday's going to come after that. It's going to be an incredible victory. And we'll talk about that next Sunday. But this week, what I want us to talk and think about is he comes to offer peace. And it's not peace from our circumstances, but within them. It's not peace that the other person will change, but that we can change. It's not a peace in self-medication, but of taking in the Spirit of God and letting him work in our lives. And it's not... A, it's not in, in taking control of life, but letting him to have control of us. And he gives us peace. That's what he offers to us. That's what he offers to every person on planet Earth. It's what we get to live out. It's what we get to tell other people about. That Jesus this week came to give peace. Riding on a donkey, a symbol of peace, with palms that are symbols of peace, that we get to have those in our soul. I'd like to pray for you and pray for myself that this would be true for us. Let's pray. Father, we, we want to stop and we recognize that this, this story that we have so often made into a nice little story that is not nice at all. In fact, it is rough and it's tough and it's hard and it's harsh and yet it's beautiful and it's incredible. And we have turned it into eggs and chicks and bunnies. And it's all about the reality of your dynamic presence. And, and they had it right when they said, Hosanna to the King, to the Son of David. Hosanna in the highest. Peace. And Father, we want to enter into that. But they didn't understand as we can now, but that had led the reality of that led to the cross. What looked like an incredible defeat. What looked like the disillusionment of the Trinity, of the tearing apart of the Godhead, was actually the most beautiful expression of mercy and justice all tied up together. And that you sent your son to do it for us. And Father, what you offer us is peace. We look forward to the day that you return. We look forward to the day that Jesus comes riding on a white horse and he will have fire in his eyes and a, and a sword in his tongue and he'll make it all right in an instant. But for now, you want that to be a reality inside of each one of us by the presence of your spirit, by the work of Christ, and that we would live out peace. We would live it out with you and live it out with one another. Live it out with everyone on planet Earth in a way that would communicate the reality of the Messiah. And so it's to that end that we pray and ask you to move in our lives. Not only today, but this whole week. That it would be a, be a people who are committed to your peace. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.